Burnbacks, always right, with Craig Burnback and Nick Vol. Hello, everybody, welcome into another edition of the podcast, Burnbacks, always right. I am Craig Burnback, and we are still in the unnamed room in Nick Vol's house that we are still trying to figure out exactly what we're going to call this. As long as we don't call it anything with cave, so that's going to happen. And it's uh, it's been a busy, you know, couple of weeks for both of us. Wedding season and, of course, pre-wedding season. Nick Vall, you've uh, you've been kind of taking part in a, a bunch of parties that are supposed to be fun, but it fills your schedule. Yeah, two bachelor parties in two weeks. So last week we went down to Bend for my friend Lucas's party, and now it's all very tame. You know, it's nothing. We're getting old, so it's not like there's anything wild happening. But it's just it's hard to do. I really. <laughs> You know what I mean? You So, okay. So, we go to Bend. I'm rooming with my buddy Chuck. Sounds great. We've got this bunk bed situation. And, and he, of course, takes the bottom bunk. And I have a badly, badly injured ankle. And Chuck's he's like, you go ahead and take the top bunk. <laughs> Every step I take up that stairs is just like a shot of pain straight to my heart. I get up the four steps. I lay down. He's already asleep. And then I hear this. Oh, he's a snorer. Oh, I could. I know Chuck. Holy cow! Chuck's a snorer. Holy you could just cow. look at him. And I, it's three in the morning by this point because you know we're up having fun and all that. And and I'm laying there and I'm weighing what's worse to listen to that all night long or to walk down those that ladder with my ankle. I pull out my phone. I recorded him snoring so I can play it back to Habits. him the next day, of course. But I say that you know the hell with it. So I go down. I go out and I sleep on the couch, and that's fine, right? I go to sleep. It's comfortable, great. But what I forget about is early morning guy. Anytime you do a group event like this, yeah. early morning guys like, I wake up every day at 7 a.m. If I'm up, you should be up. And so it's with the coffee and the full volume conversations and the making of breakfast and the slamming of doors. So I sleep, you know, three hours on Friday night. I sleep another three hours Saturday night. And I came home very tired. Yeah. Now, today, the morning we record this, I've got another one tonight. I think this one will be a little wilder, but I'm not 100% sure. But, of course, one of the main activities is golf, which I can't participate in. So I'm kind of trying to figure out how I'm going to spend three hours while they go have fun. And On the golf cart, drinking beer. There's no golf cart. We're playing at Edgefield. Oh, my God. So See, that's, that's the, the other thing. You guys are all snooty now, and you play you know, courses that won't allow a golf cart. Well, I think it's because, uh, you know, it's like it's easier for the non-golfers because not everybody in the group is a golfer. And no. so, anyway... That's true. I know our friend Brad's never played golf in his life, so I don't. So you guys can hang out <laughs> and uh, heckle. That's what you kind of do. Go to, just sit on a few holes, like mm -hmm. in your chair. You Where should have your turns. chair. Yeah, yeah, you know, like they come right, right before they, you know, putt. Noonan, noonan. <laughs> That's what you should do. It'll be more fun. Uh, I will say this. Uh, I'm going to give you some advice. When you travel with a group of people, earplugs. Easy. Pick them up. You can pick them up in an airport. You can pick it up in any pharmacy. Foam earplugs. I don't go on any trip without them, either on the plane or you, and especially when you're going on a, a group thing with guys and you don't know who you're sharing a room with. I've always got them in my bag. I got them in my bag right now, as a matter of fact, because you never know. In case the show today takes a bad well, turn. I, you're I, just I, gonna... actually, actually, just <laughs> always, I actually do always have them. I had a six foot nine, 275 pound roommate former center for the University of Rhode Island, Mike Moten. Uh, and I roomed with him in England when we studied abroad. And I learned that day two, I had not slept one wink. And I found the solution that's earplugs. Because you, <laughs> you, you try to sleep with the ear, you know, the earphones in to listen to music, they hurt. Earplugs are a beautiful thing. Uh, I just went to New Jersey, which is um, always exciting. No sleep. Uh, but I brought my wife to the great state of New Jersey for the first time since we were ma married. We did go to New Jersey for like, uh, we met, not we met here, but I mean, she was in New York and I was in New York at the same time. And uh, so we met and then she came, took the train with me and hung out with some of my friends in Jersey for like a day, but we were still kind of dating. So she wasn't getting the full fledged. We were a bunch of idiots and we're still a bunch of idiots. And this is what we did. And she was being nice because for some reason she was still you know she was we were dating she liked me now um married uh so she uh, didn't bite her tongue on certain things and uh, i learned things like exactly how many pizza places we have i never realized it because to me that's just common thing we did eat at two pizza places in three days just because i needed to kind of make the rounds but she basically said all new jersey has is strip malls with a everyone has a pizza place a chinese restaurant and an ice cream shop and a cleaners and i'm like that's not true 
And then we drove for about 45 minutes in New Jersey, like on a, not on a, not on the parkway, but on a, on a highway though, that goes through towns. And she was right. We have a lot of pizza places and that's why I'm obsessed with pizza. She goes, now I know why you're obsessed with pizza because apparently <laughs> it's the only food you can eat. And uh, she's kind of right, but I'm okay with it. But uh, it was a great trip. Uh, she survived New Jersey. You were going to survive both your bachelor parties. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and you just got to suck it up sometimes and realize I have to have fun. And that's when you know you're old, when you have to tell yourself you have to have fun. But, uh... In the news. Of course, we had the NBA draft while we were, were, we were off. The Blazers uh, didn't do anything at the draft. No picks, only a second time in their history that they had no picks, no trades, but they found a way to make some news by leaking a story. Somebody did. To the great Adrian Wojnarowski of Yahoo Sports, who gets everything. They have offered LaMarcus Aldridge a max deal, which is big because he doesn't become a free agent until next summer. So this is obviously them trying to show how much they love him. What do you think about going after LaMarcus, trying to woo him before they have to? I think it's smart. Uh, let him know that he's valued. And I think it's also a fan move because, you know, a lot of fans want wanted the Blazers to get into the draft, to make a move, to keep getting better. I feel like this is a way to, dis- like you said, to distract from that and also to, to, to placate those fans. But I think it's, it's a smart idea. He is at the peak of his career. He's got another you know, four or five years left of probably high level play, hopefully. And uh, why not lock him down? I, I don't see the problem with it, especially when you're looking at attracting other free agents. They can say, look, we've got Lillard. He's going to be set here for a few years. We've got Aldridge. He's going to be set. We've got Batum. Come, come play for us. You think he's a max player? Absolutely. Absolutely. So when LeBron James and other guys are saying they're going to take possibly less money to build their franchise, you think that LaMarcus is still worth the max deal? Yeah, them being willing to do that doesn't mean other players aren't worth the max. Right. You know, I agree. I'm just asking. I'm not I'm not I'm not saying he's not. I'm trying to, you know, back in a corner or anything like that. I'm just cuz sometimes you have to look at it that way. I mean, is LaMarcus LaMarcus Aldridge was not a max player uh, in his last contract. It was 5 years. He's getting 65 and in a way turned out to be a bargain. Um Brandon Roy, they gave the max deal to. I never thought that Brandon Roy was a max deal guy. I, I certainly didn't think he was a five-year max deal guy with those knees, uh, but kind of pressure came down on the Blazers, and they, they, everyone was like, how can you not? He's an all-star. you got to, you've got to, you've got to. And that was the old collective bargaining agreement uh, when the deals were even bigger. And, uh, and they, you know, that, I think, was part of the problem that Kevin Pritchard and uh, Paul Allen got uh, when things started going the wrong way because I think Paul Allen felt that Kevin Pritchard didn't do enough to – uh, to placate the the Blazers and, and and maybe getting it to be a four year ma- max deal rather than a five year max deal. I'm just saying that's a, that's it. I mean that's elite. That's all NBA team. I think the max deals are for all NBA team kind of well, guys. He was, he was a third team All NBA. It's yeah. twice he's been a third team All NBA. Third team. Third team. Well, okay. So he's the top 15 player in the league. It seems reasonable that the top 15 players in the league, when there are 30 teams would get max deals. It seems reasonable to me. I think that's a a valid argument. I'm not, uh, but I do think it's not as easy as people think. You know, I think people just say, he's our best player. He's an all-star. You got to give him a max deal because you got to, you know, secure him. And I think the fear of, oh, we're the Blazers. If we don't secure him, we won't be able to get anyone else. I, you know, how I feel about that. I hate that. I think it's a huge cop out. I don't think it's um, 100% true. I think that uh, there, if you offer money and winning, people will come. The Spurs have proved of it. The Thunder have done it through the draft, but guys want to go to the Thunder now. Um, so I, I don't think it's. But why do they want to go to the Thunder? They want to go to Thunder because they want to play with Kevin Durant. Sure. Yeah. Well, so you let all they want to win. Walk. Bottom line is they want to win, and Kevin Durant they think can help uh, them win. I mean, because in San Antonio, right? You could say they want to play with Tim Duncan, Ginobili, Park. Bottom line, they want to win rings, and they want to be on a team uh, that can win. Not everybody now. Not everybody wants to do that. Not everyone wants to go to San Antonio um, and be one, you know one of three and make. Um, you know, not be able to make any endorsement money per se. But uh, mm-hmm. I also think Damian Lillard's proven you can make endorsement money living in Portland. But I'm not. I'm okay with uh, Lamarcus getting the max deal. I like the fact that Neil Shea is basically backing up his words. And what I'm saying is he's made the decision. He said that Lamarcus Aldridge is the number one priority for the franchise, and then he's going out and backing it up by offering the max deal 
a year ahead of time, letting LaMarcus know, like, hey, please, don't start thinking. You know, don't start, you know, wondering where you fit. And mm-hmm. don't think, oh, Dirk's going to maybe retire. I will go get, be the guy in Dallas, my hometown, you know, or uh, or something like that. Or how do I fit in Houston if they do this, this, and this? I like the fact that he's basically saying, look, think about us. Think about us. You live in this beautiful house. Why would you want to buy a new house? <laughs> look, we'll do upgrades to the house. That's what they did last year. And, oh, you know what? By the way, your house is worth a whole lot more. And they're trying to make it uh, more and more attractive for him here. And so he doesn't get distracted and start thinking, what if? I think it's a smart deal. I'm okay with the max deal. But I do always have that worry. The one thing about LaMarcus I'll say is injury-wise, he's, in, he's been injured. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, quite a lot. But nothing knock on wood or whatever it is, nothing serious. I mean, it's not, his knees aren't bad. I mean, his heart issue was a, I don't want to say fluke, but taken care of. You know, he he hurt his hip, got that taken care of. He fell on his back this year and look, that could have been way worse. Uh, Came back, you know, groin pulls, but nothing that looks, you know, he doesn't have the chronic lower back issues. He doesn't have the foot breaks. He doesn't have the bad, bad knees. So you hope that you're giving him in the contract that uh, max deal five years, it'll be his prime. So I say, you know, nicely done by the Blazers. A little bit of a distraction for the fans, as you mentioned, mm-hmm. and make LaMarcus, you know, feel like he should not think about any place else. So, and speaking of that, now you've got uh, two of the biggest stars in the NBA, Carmelo, LeBron, both opt out. Are either one of them leaving? Is LeBron leaving New York? I mean, love, I wish, gosh, oh, this, that's, that's, <laughs> that's the Nick fan in me. Is LeBron leaving Miami, Carmelo leaving New York? I feel like Carmelo is most certainly going to go. I I mean, the only thing that, to me, could get him to stay is the power of Phil Jackson and the promise of brighter times. But Carmelo's 29, 30? 29, right Right about 30. He he can't wait much longer. There are options out there for him to play on winners, to contend immediately. The Knicks are realistically two to three years away from doing anything, as far as I'm concerned. I got to tell you, I don't think Carmelo's leaving. You don't think so? No, not from what I'm seeing. And you say there's the only reason for him to stay. Well... $30 $30 million well, is something. Okay. And people, 30 million reasons, people yeah. you know, sneeze at it. Like, oh, they're already so rich. But it's not always about the money with this guy. It's about ego. And does he really want to go to Chicago and be making less money than Carlos Boozer if they don't amnesty him? Probably not. Does he really want to go to Chicago and, and, and be um, number two behind Derrick Rose? I'm not sure. I mean, he. everyone loves to say, I want to be a winner and I don't care. But not everyone's willing to, to, to say, I want to be a winner and... And I think somebody else can, you know, lead me there and follow. And if you go to Chicago, you A, got to hope that Derrick Rose's knee. Very true. Which it's not. I'm sorry. You can't go through two major knee surgeries, miss basically two seasons, and be the same. We live in Portland. We should know that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just physically impossible. Does it mean that he can't be a a great player? No. Does it mean he can't be the the NBA MVP again? Probably. I mean, I really don't think that he can play at that level. Maybe he will, but Carmelo wants to lead a team. And you go there, Derek Rose is the star. Uh, he's from Chicago. He's the man. Uh, in New York, Carmelo can be the man. He's born in Brooklyn. You know, he was raised in Baltimore, but he's pulled the roots. You know, I'm playing my, with my back in my, with my, you know, where I grew, was born. Uh, and look, Phil Jackson's already made one move that I think was brilliant. I mean, he dumped Tyson Chandler. That was, that was a great move. Dumped for the Ray Knicks. Felton. Uh, got you know some money in the long term, and also I mean he, he Calderon is a real point guard. He's, he's, a, he's an excellent point guard. He's like Pablo Prigioni, but better. Who they already have? It's 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 crazy. Right, and they got a they got last year a number one pick in uh, in Larkin, who was 18th overall, snapped his ankle in in the summer league, so didn't have a real rookie year. So he might be a uh, a great back, not great. That's a ridiculous word, Craig. He might be a solid backup point guard. <laughs> I'm just saying they got real players, mm-hmm. and uh, Dallin Bear's old, you know, and he but is what he is. He's serviceable though. He I is mean, what he he's is. A, he's he's a stiff. If you're Knicks, he's Herb Williams. You know what I mean? Yeah, but I mean Herb could shoot. So, so but I mean he's but seven you know for I mean. one. He's been actually healthy. The older he's gotten, the healthier he's gotten, which is weird. But he he blocks shots. He can rebound. Um, and Tyson Chandler was garbage last year. So two years ago, he was great. For Dallas, he won a title for them. You know, he was he was the uh, defensive player of the year. But in the triangle offense, Tyson Chandler's not going to be great. Um, we know Dallin Bear can set a pick, uh, and we know he can he can work with scores like Carmel because he did it with Dirk. Um, so I think that that, that Phil is kind of showing uh, Carmelo like, hey man, I'm making moves. We're going to get there. Do you want to be 
my big piece? Do you want to be, you know, my, my queen when it, on this chessboard or not? If you not, do, not king. Well, I think it's weird because the king barely does anything. In I chess. don't know anything about chess. The, so. the queen can do it all. <laughs> the queen can do it all. The king, you just kind of protect. The queen's the killer. I, you know, I got to be honest. When I was saying it, I was going back and forth, and <laughs> I couldn't figure it out. Uh, maybe it was a bad analogy. Bottom line, I just came up with it. But I'm just saying, I think Carmelo's going to end up staying. I think he wants to be the, you know, to be able to say, I'm in. I got wooed by others, and I'm coming to New York. Uh, but maybe that's me being a little bit of a Nick fan. Uh, but at the same time, I don't see anything else being a, a guarantee for him because wherever, I mean, like Houston, he's not going to Houston. I don't think he's not would, going. It to It would Dallas. be a terrible fit in Houston. I don't. I mean, I don't know if he'd be a terrible fit because everyone. I think Carmelo gets a bum rap, man. I think everyone says he he's uh, he's selfish. He can't pass. He doesn't do this. He doesn't do that. And I just think it's and he's not a winner. I've talked about it before. He won a national title by himself. Um, he's won Olympic gold medals where he was the best player on the team and LeBron loves him. Uh, you know, I mean, guys that at the elite level love him. They want to play with him. Uh, he can spot up shoot at his size. He can score inside. He does rebound. And is he a willing passer? I'm not sure because I wouldn't pass any of those guys either. So I just think he gets a bum rap for people saying, oh, he couldn't fit in with this, this, or this. I don't I don't think he fits into Houston because I don't think he and James Harden have complementary skill sets. Dwight Howard doesn't. Who has a complementary skill set to James Harden? Honestly, I want, I want to know who. A spot-up shooter, I think. I mean, I'm just saying, like, the guy the guy is an offensive wizard, and he and he is a guy that's a one-on-one player. So no one's going to be, quote-unquote, complementary to James Harden. Sometimes I think, like, who's complementary to Kobe Bryant? I, I, I think a guy like who he had I think Steve Blake like for example how he worked with Brandon Roy where Roy or Harden or Kobe dominates the ball Steve Blake or a similar spot up shooter spots up Carmelo can gives spot him, up shoot with him the that best outlet. of them well but yeah you don't want to diminish okay I'm just saying you know, though Carmelo to that to that because they both need the ball in their hands to score I guess but guys games have to change I mean the heat proved that and, the, and you can change your game and win I mean people said LeBron and Dwayne Wade couldn't work together because they both need the ball mm-hmm. oh and then everyone's like but, but the difference is is Le- LeBron is an active passer he loves passer. to pass and and Harden actually is a very good passer too when he wants to be Ugh. and and <laughs> you know when you're, he wants to be you're being kind in the pick and roll he's a very effective player yeah I, 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 look James Harden had a terrible playoffs, and that's the image that's in our head. He's a good, he, he can score, uh, and he, you know, he's a fantastic regular season basketball player at this point. I'm just saying, like people, you don't know what players can, great players can do until you put them in certain positions, and you know, you go back to the to to so many teams where people say, well, how you know they can't play together, then they play together and they win. Basketball is a strange sport because there's only one ball, there's five guys on the court. It's not like baseball where you each get an individual bat. It's not like football where you each have individual roles. Uh, in basketball, things are shared. The basketball has to be shared. Everyone, everyone has to do everything. You all got to dribble. You all got to rebound. You all got to score. You all got to pass. Not everyone does it uh, well, but you got to do these skills. So I, I think that Carmelo is often um, criticized for things that he hasn't done yet. Be- mm-hmm. People saying he can't. Maybe he can. We'll see. I hope he stays in New York because without him, the rebuilding is going to be well, very, 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 very tough for the Knicks. Before we move on to the, the big topic, I would just like to point out we found a way to mention your New York Knicks in like four consecutive podcasts. That's what podcasts. I do. That's anyway, what I do. Let's move on to the big topic. Yeah. The big topic. The NBA draft. It was interesting. Or was it? That's my question. As a Blazer fan, did you care? I, I did find myself. I, I watched it. I went over to Orion's house. We made chicken wings, which were just phenomenal, by the way. Uh, and we watched it, and and I found myself a little less connected to it than normal. Even though we all agree it's a pretty spectacular draft class, it is hard to get excited when you know you have no no stake in it. Uh, but it was still enjoyable. What I was really surprised about by, was the lack of action. There were only like two trades yeah. all night long, which kind of makes it less fun as well. I think it just shows you how much people value the picks they're getting. They don't want to give them up. Um, so I, I really I really enjoyed it from that perspective just to see how seriously these guys were taking it and it felt like they were actually sort of building their future instead of moving pieces. Yeah, um, which is – look, the thing with drafts is I always say uh, I like the NBA draft because it's short and sweet. I hate the NFL draft oh because God. it goes forever. Everyone loves it. And I'm like, you don't know what the heck's going to happen. It's a big crapshoot. It's a total – um, you know, win before you've actually won. I mean, oh, that's a great pick, or that's oh, what a steal. Look, I can tell you as a Nick fan, they don't pan out. As a Blazer fan, 
you know, they don't pan out. The day, draft day trades, Rudy Fernandez, greatest thing that ever happened. What a steal. Uh, that didn't work out great. Oh, Jared Bayless. Oh, he's going to do the, No, that didn't work out. I mean, it just, and you get so excited about second round. Oh, Luke Babbitt. Oh, geez, that's terrible. No, he was a first rounder. I know. I'm just saying, like, it was terrible. I mean, you, but then yeah. on the night, you don't think it's terrible. Everyone's awesome when they get drafted. Everyone's underrated. Uh, everyone's a steal. Everyone's got a chip on their shoulder. And then you look at it long term, and it, it, it really doesn't mean much. I mean, uh, well, that's a ridiculous statement. It, it cannot, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't always pan out. It's a big night for the teams. As a fan, I think uh, it's fun, but people get too caught up in it. It's such a crapshoot. You don't know. Um, to me, it was a simple decision at the top. I was like, why are they? You know, why are we even debating who's going one? Um, I like Jabari Parker, but Wiggins' upside is ridiculous. He had a 45-inch vertical. He was the number one player coming out of high school. Um, he had time score. You know, he scored 30. He had 30-point games at Kansas. He can't shoot so much. Um, but to me, it was a no-brainer. Like, why would you not pick Wiggins? Um, and they did. And I think that they're going to be, you know, that's going to be the smart move by Cleveland. And then last year, why would you pick Bennett? Like, sometimes it's bizarre that, that, that we're, we're schmoes sitting on our couches or, you know, me in a sports office been doing this for a long time. But, you know, I've never been, uh, I've, never, I've never done the analytics for an NBA team. I'm not a general manager, but I was like, Bennett, that's a joke pick. And it was a joke pick. Maybe he pans out uh, later. But right now it's terrible. And to me, Wiggins was a no-brainer. Uh, the most interesting thing about the draft uh, was the Sixers um, because they apparently don't want anyone to play for them right away. <laughs> it's insane to me to, to pick a guy in Embiid who everybody thinks may be good but has the injury thing who's not going to play for a while. They picked Dario Saric or whatever who's going to be over two years. That's crazy. So they're not only actively tanking last season, they're tanking this upcoming season too. And, and for what? Well, they have five second-round draft picks. Had, yeah. What are they, what are they if if I'm a 76ers fan, why on earth would I buy a ticket next year? And and so they can be good in four years, five That's, years by the time these players mature. I don't get it. I, I right because no, remember they picked Noel's last year and they sat him out the entire year. It's kind of like they're red shirting guys. The MB pick to me was fine. I didn't mind it at all because I think it makes sense that that guy should have been could have been number one. You're the Sixers. You have a chance to take a risk again admittedly, but I like Embiid better than Noel's, you know, it's for the upside. Everyone's talking, I mean, they, and we'll call, talk about comparisons. The comparison was Akeem Olajuwon, you know, one of the greatest centers of all time. If it's if anything close to that, uh, that's a huge pick, but the Sarge thing, I mean, come on, man, get somebody to can play now, mm -hmm. you know, like that's just, that's crazy to me to do that. And then to, to stockpile all those second rounders when the percentage of second rounders that make it in the NBA is low, the percentage of second rounders that end up being starters is even lower. So what do you do? Like, I thought they were going to package those for something, you know, mm -hmm. later in mm -hmm. the draft, maybe you got five of them and you want to be at the top of the second round, or maybe you can go get a backup point guard that can play something it was just yeah and and look i i hate the sixers because i'm a nick fan but even even i felt bad for sixers fans and that's that's hard to do so yes that to me was the most interesting team uh in the draft because i thought everything else kind of went sort of as planned um and now we just wait and see if everyone did their homework correctly and if the if the guys live up to the hype uh but the sixers were interesting but the comparison thing, I touched on it. God, that drove me nuts. It drives me nuts. And I know, look, it's a tough job doing draft work and being an analyst and what ESPN does because you're trying to explain to novice fans um, players they've never seen before and what, what they're like. So the easiest thing to do is say, oh, they're like this guy. But the comparisons are jokes because it's always like best ever players. Like this guy's like Gary Payton. No, he can't shoot. Uh, but he, you know, they he's com a, they're compared Alfred Payton, I yes, believe, to Gary Payton. Exactly. And I'm like, Alfred Payton from Louisiana Lafayette. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, Gary Payton is one of the greatest of all time. And he was, un he, I think it's fair to say Gary Payton was unique. A oh, tall, absolutely. tall point guard who was defense first and uh, didn't care couldn't score a lick when he got in the NBA because his shot was hideous, figured out what he could do right and did it better than anyone else maybe ever. There's no, I mean, to say that there's going to be a player like Gary Payton, like, oh, that's the comparison. That's crazy to me, but I get it. Or comparing a guy to Tim Duncan, but the worst, 
the worst was Doug McDermott. And this <laughs> drives me insane. The comparison, the Wally Zerbiak one, I was cool with because Wally Zerbiak did shoot from distance. And if you look at the two, they look like brothers. They're the same size. They have some, both had some inside ability as well. And they're tall guys who can flat out shoot from deep. The second comparison was Adam Morrison. Really? Really? Come on. Because, I mean, and then you know why. We're looking at skin color to skin color here, and it drives me nuts. Adam Morrison was a scorer, no doubt. But he was his outside shot wasn't great. He, he couldn't make a three in the NBA in his short period of time. That was the problem, that his shooting percentage was so low. Because in general, he had... He was a scorer. He threw things off the backboard. He went in flippy flips. He turned around craziness. But he wasn't a spot-up shooter uh, with the ability of Doug McDermott. So that just drove me nuts. I get why they have to do it. But every once in a while, how about you think, hey, maybe the melanin's not what we, you know, we can find a guy with a different melanin level to compare him to. Well, along those lines, I don't remember if ESPN did it, but Nick Stauskas from Michigan, I've heard lots of Jimmer Fredette comparisons, which is insane because Jimmer Fredette is, a great shooter, but that's about it. And Stauskas had like a 38 inch vertical. He can finish. He can, right. he, he can play. Jim and Fredette never, du- never dunked in his like life in college. And Stauskas, you have like a million of him, you know, two hand dunking. Yeah. So you're right. That's like six foot three white guys who can shoot. Check it, check it for that. You know, it's just, that drove me nuts. JJ Redick. Yeah. That's, you know, and that look, and I don't think the JJ Redick and Jim and Fredette, comparisons were right because though Jimmer Fredette did um it w- is a good shooter he did create a lot of he was more of a scorer than JJ Redick was who's one of the great you know the best shooters in the world and that's what JJ Redick did I don't think they're similar at all because I think that JJ Redick doesn't need the basketball at all ever to score except for one second when he shoots it mm-hmm. and Jimmer Fredette that's the problem is he can't do that. He can't just sit in the corner and uh, shoot, you know, and co- he needs the ball, he needs to dribble, and that's not working in the NBA. So, yes, the comparison's understandable, but they graded me every time. So, so real quick, before before we run out of time here, yeah. who, who, who did well in the draft and who really sucked it up? Well, Cleveland did great. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's the most obvious thing. Yeah. I think that uh, I think that's a great uh, – to get a guy with that ability at that age, I think it will help, and he doesn't – um, at this point, you've got waiters and you've got Irving guys who, who love to score. This guy's a defense. Right now, he's ready to play defense against anybody. Uh, he seems he's got the, the right mentality to figure out what he can do with his game. Uh, and he can play the three. So I think that that was uh, – and basically what I'm saying, Cleveland did great because I don't think they messed it up, mm-hmm. which is huge because they seriously messed it up last year. Um, look, I, I, I know it's the simplest thing to say, but – Milwaukee did great. Oh, absolutely. Because they got a guy in Jabari Parker who wants to play there. Mm -hmm. And that is huge for your fan base to get a guy at number two overall that's not going, oh, man, Mm -hmm. I got to go to Milwaukee. He's like, I wanted to get picked by Milwaukee. Uh, The Sixers, we talked about it. I thought, you get two, you get two lottery picks, and neither one of them are gonna play. That like when you say it out loud, there's no way to say that was that was good. Um, So. I, I I did not like I did not like what they walked away with, even though I think that Embiid might end up being huge. But at this point, I didn't like what, what they did at all. I really didn't like uh, what the Clippers did. I don't know. You, they took yep. C.J. Wilcox from Washington one year after taking a nearly identical player in Reggie Bullock. They already have Jamal Crawford, J.J. Redick to do those jobs. So unless they have some other move in mind, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, especially as thin as they're up front. That said, I don't mind if the Clippers make bad choices. They have a history of it, and I would prefer they go <laughs> back to being terrible because I'm not a big Clippers fan. Um, but, yeah, you kind of already touched on the guys, the teams that I thought really did a good job. And it so. was a weird pick, but I'll say this. Until they start the season, I don't know if you judge that pick yet because we don't know what's going to happen. Free agency sure. starts Tuesday. Uh, so... I liked I like C.J. Wilcox as a player. As a player, yeah. So I'm not gonna I'm I'm not gonna poo poo it because I think sometimes we were when you're you're a 28, you know you, there are a lot of guys that are picked that low that don't ever play. Sure. So if you could get a player that can be in a rotation, you can find way to make uh, that valuable even at 28, even if you do have a you know the Jamal Crawfords and the J.J. Redick mm-hmm. and I, you know and uh, neither one of those two guys you just mentioned, they play on one end. Their yeah, defense is horrific. And Wilcox can play some D. So maybe they were thinking that way. Because you know what? When you think you're a, a, a contender 
Maybe you just need that one guy that you think can go in and lock up uh, with tw- you know 12 seconds on the shot clock. The other team's got the ball, and you're up one. And Jamal Crawford, Crawford and J.J. Redick aren't that guy. So it could be that simple. Um, so you do have to wait on these things. Uh, a little bit, and that's what's great about the uh, about the the NBA draft, the NFL draft, is that we get to speculate, then we forget about it, and then five years later we can do the old "oh, who had a good draft" thing, and and it's a completely different evaluation. So sometimes I have, you have to admit, Nick, you don't know what's right, and I get to say that because of course Burnback's always right. So you just close there, but do you need to do the final thoughts thing? Or yeah. I saw thirty-one. I just wanted to. Sure. Thank <laughs> you.